Warning, Kinda Murdery contains adult themes, explicit language, and descriptions of violence. It is not suitable for anyone, and we recommend you stop listening now. Hello everyone, and welcome to Kinda Murdery, a true crime podcast that's mostly about murder, and always about the strange and compelling stories that arise when the path less traveled twists to darkness, and those who walk its shadows surrender to violence and moral corruption. I'm your host, Zevin Odelberg, and thank you for lending me your courage and good company for the perilous journey ahead. I'd like to welcome you to Dr. Devil's Breath. Holly Crippen and the murder of Cora Crippen. This is a very special episode of Kinda Murdery, because it's not, in fact, an episode of Kinda Murdery. What you're about to hear is an episode of the fantastic true crime podcast, British Murders, hosted by Stuart Blues. I was lucky enough to guest on British Murders, and I brought with me two different murder stories. The first a story about a poisoning murder from 2020 that involved Devil's Breath, and the second, a very famous murder by a very famous murderer, a man who for nearly a hundred years was a fixture at Madame Tussauds Wax Museum in London. I'm speaking, of course, of homeopathic doctor Holly Crippen. That's H-A-W-L-E-Y, Mr. Holly Crippen who poisoned and then brutally mutilated his wife's body, leaving behind little more than a sack of human flesh. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so please put your personal items underneath the seat in front of you. Stow your carry-on in the overhead compartment. Let go of the cares of the day, but make sure your seatbelt is fastened, because there's turbulence expected ahead. My guest appearance on British Murders with Stuart Blues, telling the story of Dr. Holly Harvey Crippen and the murder of his wife, Cora Crippen. That's right, British Murders with Stuart Blues starts now. You are now listening to British Murders, the true crime podcast. Hello everyone and welcome to British Murders, the podcast that focuses exclusively on British murder cases and serial killers. This week we're kind of going transatlantic, I would say. I've got my friend Zevan Odelberg here from Kind of Murdery Podcast, and I believe we're going to do some American-British true crime kind of murdery story. Zevan, welcome to the show. Hey, Stuart. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. And yes, Kind of Murdery, my podcast, we do tell American murder stories. Now, I'm not sure I ever made the conscious decision to not tell a murder story in another country, but so far I've only told American murder stories. I grew up very rurally, and so when I first started podcasting, my instinct was to look for stories in very rural places, of which America, with its vast expanses, is chock full of deserts and backwoods, etc. So I think I just kind of naturally fell into telling American-only stories. And then, as you know, found your show and loved it and reached out to you. And now we're friends. And that's that. But yeah, I'm very excited to be here. And uh, I'm going to tell you about an American murderer who killed someone in Britain. Tell us about sort of your history and your background. How did you get into doing this kind of thing? So I spent 15 years as a Hollywood executive working at Fox and Disney in television and film distribution, living in Los Angeles. And over the course of that time, I made various friendships in show business. And then Disney bought Fox and I got my contract bought out, which is a proud man's way of saying I got laid off. And then right after that, the pandemic hit. So I was sitting around with nothing to do. And I have a close friend who lives in New York, who's a producer, writer, director. And this was right at the time during the beginning of COVID when things were just really really awful in New York. It was awful. They were stacking the bodies in the streets because the morgues were full. And so I thought of him and his family and I called him up and I was basically just to say, are you guys okay? And he said, yeah, we're fine. And I've started a television production company that has now suddenly become a podcast production company because that's what we can make. And without even really thinking, I said, well, I've got an idea for a podcast because he was doing podcasts specifically and explicitly 
focused on crime. So I, I said to him, I've got this idea for a podcast. It's called Kind of Murdery, Ghost Towns of the Mojave Desert. And you basically go through the Mojave Desert and you find these little towns, which often are sort of silver airstream meth lab hovels. And you look into the history of those towns and find out how they became the way they are today. So let's have, before we get into the story then, let's get into, because I know you're a health advocate. Right. So I have cerebral palsy, which is a, a nervous disorder that inhibits motor function as well as physical development. Uh, I'm very lucky because mine is very mild and I've been lucky enough to have medical care that could help me become as normal as possible. That said, I've had my left side surgically rebuilt three times and before that I was pretty close to Quasimodo in the way in which I would get around. But then through a combination of essentially my parents, the way they chose to handle it and the fact that I was relatively able passing, I spent most of my life in very serious denial about having CP. That was really toxic for me because what happens is if you don't admit to yourself that you have a disability, you start coming up with other reasons for why things are really difficult or why you're failing. I would be telling myself things like, you're lazy, you don't work hard enough. You, I would give myself all these reasons to explain my physical difficulty that weren't the quite obvious, you have a leg and a half, not two. I have a whole left leg. I don't want to mislead anybody, but to a certain extent, I'm carrying it around as opposed to kind of getting your natural energy return that most people have when they walk or run. So for me, starting to talk about disabled person issues was really a mental health evolution for myself, where I realized that I had to stop denying to myself that I had these struggles. And talking about them became a way to force myself to confront them. So my hope really is that Kind of Murdery, the Kind of Murdery audience and community can become a support community, not just for people with disabilities, physical and otherwise, but also for people with mental health issues and really for anyone who feels like their life experience is unique and probably not something that occurs to most people. It's good that you're promoting this so much on the show. And I like that you call it out at the start as well. One of the things I always share is that there's a free three-digit number, at least in the U.S. It's 988. You can call it. And you'll immediately be connected with a counselor who can talk to you about substance use, mental health issues, or suicidal thoughts. Ours is called Samaritans. Their number is 116123. If anyone's in the UK listening, that's our equivalent number. I think they're anytime free number. Talk about anything mental health wise, physical, anything that's worrying you. 116123 is Samaritans. So I just want to put that out there. I would also just remind everybody that another really important lesson that I've come around to recently, even even if you're different, even if you're other, even if you feel like you yourself are broken, not only can you do good, but you can actually still be the hero of the story. Absolutely. This convo got a little bit deeper than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> We might as well get into the story. I think now's as good a time as any now that we've got everything off our chests. So I am calling today's story Dr. Devil's Breath. I've named it that in part because it's a pretty famous case, actually. Some of your listeners may be familiar with it. This case was the first time a fugitive was caught by use of the telegram. It was also the first, but notably not the last known case of hyosin butyl bromide poisoning. But before I get directly into that story, I want to talk just a bit about this particular poison. Now, Hyacin butyl bromide is a chemical marketed commercially as the drug scopolamine or buscopan. It's primarily used as either an anti seasickness or anti nausea medication or to treat the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome. Before you say, well, that sounds relatively harmless, hyacin is derived from various nightshades, including nightshade itself and gypsum wheat, all from the same family as tomatoes, potatoes, and peppers. Not something you would put in your salad. Yeah, exactly. In the US, particularly in rural areas like like I'm from, where we run a lot of sheep and cattle, we call gypsum weed loco weed. Loco being the Spanish word for insane because if your livestock eats it, they trip out, act loco, and die. But in fact, gypsum is a nickname too. It's an American marbles in the mouth bastardization of Jamestown weed, named after British settlers of colonial Jamestown, Virginia, who experimented with eating the plant as a recreational drug, and like today's sheep and cattle of the American West, tripped out and died. That's the raw plant, of course. Now, the murders I'm going to tell you about today feature the commercially synthesized drug, which has another evocative name in Colombia, where it's a favorite of cartels and kidnappers because of its ability to induce a long-lasting, deep, coma-like sleep. They call it devil's breath, but 
functionally what we're talking about is the well-meaning friar's sleeping potion from Romeo and Juliet here. But you take too much and you're dead. So let's get to the Devil's Breath murder, shall we? The main story I brought you today happened way back in 1910, but I'm going to open really quickly with a Devil's Breath murder from 2019. Stuart, I know recently you did the story of Stephen Port, the grinder killer. Mm -hmm. The story I'm about to touch on here involves another grinder killer, actually grinder killers, that used grinder to find, stock, and murder their victims. They were a killer couple. I'm going to take a quick dive into a very recent killer couple story from 2019 that shares key themes with our upcoming Dr. Devil's Breath story and demonstrates the continued relevance of hyacinth poisoning. And when I say it shares key themes, it's hyacinth poisoning, killer couples, and something of a love triangle. So look out for those three things in both stories. Our killer couple in this 2019 murder story are 25-year-old Joel Osai and his girlfriend, Diana Christia, 19. These are British killers, by the way. This oh, is a British you. murder story. Very so kind. Osai, Joel Osai, referred to Christia as his Romanian goddess wife. They killed in 20. 19 and were convicted in 2020 of murdering Irish dance champion Adrian Murphy and poisoning another man whose identity remained confidential with, you guessed it, devil's breath. Diana Christia knew all about Joel Osai's murderous ways. She kept in touch with him the entire time he was in his victim's flats. She told him, ask for the Wi-Fi once you get there, and she messaged him during, probably before the murdering, but during one of these murderous escapades, she wrote to him, I love you, my weird little satanic wizard a nice pet name there yeah, my weird little satanic wizard. Osai targeted his first victim using the fake name Remy on the dating app Grinder. He went to his victim's flat in Walthamstow. You'll have to tell me how I'm supposed to say that. Might be Walthamstow, I would have yeah, thought. Yeah, probably. Us Americans don't know how to speak English good. We, <laughs> Stow? Me no speak English good. Okay, so he <laughs> went to his victim's flat in Walthamstow under the guise of casual sex on May 30th, 2019. But instead, he poisoned his 40-year-old victim's orange juice using using scopolamine, another name for hyacinth, whatever, whatever. It's hard to say all these scientific words. He went to the bathroom, secretly brought the orange juice into the bathroom, and dosed it with the anti-nausea drug. So as I mentioned earlier, scopolamine's been used in South America, particularly in Colombia, where it's referred to as devil's breath because it's used to incapacitate kidnapping victims usually, rendering them deeply unconscious for long periods of time. This is what Joel Osai gave to his first victim, and his first victim survived and is therefore anonymous, testified at the trial, but under the guise of anonymity because he didn't want his identity or life to be revealed. So while his victim lay unconscious, Osai helped himself to more than 2,000 pounds worth of property, including Ray-Ban sunglasses, bank cards, wallet, iPad, iPhones, two laptops, a PlayStation, and an Amazon Alexa. Christia, the girlfriend, later put many of these items up for sale on, and this is the first time I learned about this particular website, it's called Spock. Spock, which yeah. I was previously unfamiliar with, but I now understand to be like a British eBay. Kind of. It's because eBay charges so many fees. Mm. It's like Facebook Marketplace. I would compare it to that. You don't pay fees and stuff, but it's also not as regulated, I suppose, as eBay. So yeah, they put all the stuff up for sale on Spock. Now, Osai's first victim, as I mentioned, was discovered by a neighbor that evening, taken to the hospital and survived. Two days later, Joel Osai used Grinder to strike again, but this time with fatal consequences for his second victim, Irish dance champion, Adrian Murphy. Having exchanged details with Osai on Grindr, Mr. Murphy invited him to the apartment block in Battersea, where he had been staying on June 1st of 2019. Using scopolamine, Osai poisoned the Coca-Cola Mr. Murphy was drinking, and then went on to steal more than, again, 2,000 pounds worth of goods from the flat, including a Louis Vuitton wallet. The following day, by which time Mr. Murphy had died, the defendants, well, Osai and his girlfriend, the murderers, created a PayPal account in Murphy's name and tried to buy diamonds worth $80,000 from a jeweler in New York. Mr. Murphy's bank cards were also used on two occasions to order food from Deliveroo. So Christia, the 19-year-old girlfriend, put some of these stolen items up for sale online and on Spock she wrote, brand new Gasper Louis Vuitton wallet comes in a gift bag. And then on June 4th, three days
days after his encounter with Joel Osai, Mr. Murphy was discovered dead in his flat. Together, Joel Osai and Diana Christia planned these ruthless attacks, which cost the life of Adrian Murphy and seriously injured another victim. Their sole motivation was to steal property and make money from their victims. Now, at the trial, the prosecution was able to link Osai and Christia to the crimes using a variety of evidence, including telephone evidence and CCTV evidence. The crucial evidence was given by the surviving victim, who was able to pick out his attacker from an identity parade. CCTV footage shown to the jurors showed Osai leaving both Mr. Murphy's address and the surviving victim's address with bags of their property, which he then passed on to Christia to sell online. However, Christia and Osai had a falling out, and Christia called 999 and told the operator about the drug killing. This enabled the police to identify the drug that had been used. Police also found a number of the stolen items at her address and text messages between herself and Osai, which evidenced their plan to commit the crimes. Joel Osai, 25, was found guilty of murdering 43-year-old Adrian Murphy and administering a poison or noxious substance to endanger life following a trial at Croydon Crown Court, which concluded on Friday, October 23, 2020. Osai also admitted two counts of theft and eight counts of fraud. His girlfriend, Diana Christia, 19, was also found guilty of murder, administering a poison or noxious substance to endanger life, eight counts of fraud, and two counts of theft in the same trial. Joel Osai was sentenced to a life term with a minimum of 32 years. Christia was also sentenced to a life term with a minimum of 16 years. So uh, there you go. That's a killer couple devil's breath murder story that even features a love triangle of a sort, right? And those are all components of the main story as well. Now let's talk about the very first recorded case of murder by hyacinth butyl bromide or devil's breath. This is a story and a murderer that I'm calling Dr. Devil's Breath, but who is better known by his real name, Dr. Holly Harvey Crippen, a killer whose heinous mutilation of his wife's body turned him into an infamous national celebrity. So famous, or notorious in fact, that his waxwork stood in Madame Tussauds' chain Chamber of Horrors in London, as did his actual spectacles, until the Chamber of Horror closed in 2016 to be replaced by some Sherlock Holmes-themed exhibit, which is a weak choice by Madame Tussauds, if you ask me. That's disappointing. Not that I want to, you know, see his actual glasses, but that would have been cool. I've never been to the London one. The story will continue after these quick messages. And now, back to the story. Is this a name you've heard before, Stuart? I think I've heard it before. I don't know if that's because of our conversations or... I've probably stumbled across him at some point. So I had not heard it before, before discovering the story. And my research led me to believe that he was so famous in Britain, in part because he has a distant family member in America who, whenever he visits London, gets the stink eye from customs. And they make some comment about, oh, you're part of the murder family. But who knows? I had not heard of him, but I discovered this story and I found it extremely compelling. So here we go. In 1893, Holly Harvey Crippen married his second wife, Cora Turner, in Jersey City, New Jersey, USA. Seven years later, in 1900, they moved to London, where Holly was employed as a representative for Munyon's Remedies, a company making homeopathic remedies, while Cora, using the stage name Belle Elmore, had aspirations to be a music hall artist. Unfortunately for the Crippen family, Bella had zero talent. None. In fact, neither Bella nor Cora, as I just alluded to by calling it her stage name, was the real name of Mrs. Crippen. She had been born, and I'm going to butcher this, as Kunagunde Makamatsky, and was the daughter of a Russian-Polish father and a German mother. She was also a very overbearing and dominant wife. Her husband supported her ambitions to be at first an opera singer, and then when it became clear that she couldn't really sing, all she really managed to get out of her showbiz career was a few showbiz friends and the position of treasurer of the music hall ladies guild in london so we know from the outset that they went to london to pursue Cora's dreams or bella's dreams depending on which name you choose of being first an opera star which of course takes a tremendous amount of talent and then essentially a british vaudeville star which also takes a tremendous amount of talent and she could do neither which means that we're dealing really with a bitterly disappointed woman who has been reduced to keeping financial notes for the local club of all the ladies who actually can do the things that she wants to do. Oh, that must be hard. I would think that that 
would create a deep degree of unhappiness, one for which I have a fair amount of empathy. But that's where they are. That's what's going on with the family. So in September 1905, Dr. Crippen and his wife took a lease on 39 Hilldrop Crescent in Holloway. Part of the thinking behind this move to a new house was that they could now have separate bedrooms. According to Dr. Crippen, Bell or Cora had never really been a sexual person, and according to what he would later say, all physical relations between them had ceased by 1907. Now remember, the murder occurred in 1910. Crippen, meanwhile, had fallen in love. The object of Dr. Crippen's desire was Ethel Lenade, a typist who worked for him. At about the same time that Crippen and Bell stopped having relations, Crippen and Ethel became lovers, and that situation continued from 1907 to 1910, the very dawn of 1910. Because on the evening of Monday, January 31st, 1910, the Crippens threw a dinner party for two close friends of Bell's, Paul and Clara Marinetti. The meal passed pleasantly enough, except for one incident. Paul Marinetti asked to use the toilet, and when Crippen didn't escort him upstairs to show him where it was, Bell viciously berated him. Bell was furious with Holly Harvey Crippen for not walking Mr. Martinetti to the loo. By the time the Martinettis finally left, it was around 1 a.m on Monday, February 1st, and it would be the last time that anyone saw Bell Elmore Crippen alive. Over the next week or so, people began to ask where Bell was. Crippen said that she'd gone to America. As the days passed, the story was changed and now she'd fallen ill. Finally, Crippen told people that his wife had passed away. There was, however, one big problem with this. Ethel Lenave had started wearing some of Bell's jewelry, and by the end of February, she had moved in with Crippen at Hilldrop Crescent. Friends grew suspicious, and in due course, those suspicions were passed on to the police. So on the 8th of July, so already we're some seven months after the presumed murder date, six months after, Chief Inspector Walter Dew called at Hilldrop Crescent, where he found Ethel alone. Crippen was at work. So Dew visited Crippen there, and the two returned together to Hilldrop Crescent, where Crippen happily showed the officer around the house. He also told Dew a different story. Bell was no longer dead. She'd left him for another man, he'd said she was dead because he was embarrassed, and that other man was almost certainly Bruce Miller, an American she'd met in late 1903. Dew told Crippen that it would be better if Bell contacted him to confirm the story, and Crippen said that he would place an advertisement in certain newspapers asking for her to make contact. After the police visit Crippen's house, now things start to move very quickly. On the next day, the 9th of July, Crippen shaves off his mustache and disguises Ethel Leneve as a boy. They traveled to Brussels. There in Brussels, they bought tickets for passage to Canada, and then traveled to Antwerp to board the ship, the SS Montrose, for the voyage to Canada, traveling as father and son. At about the same time, Chief Inspector Dew returned to Hilldrop Crescent. He was surprised to find Crippen and Ethel missing, and decided to make another routine search of the house. In the cellar, he noticed some loose bricks in the floor. Officers were ordered in to make a more thorough search, and beneath those bricks, they found the remains of a body. The body was headless, limbless, and boneless. Little more, really, than a pile of flesh. But it was female, and the chief inspector knew that it was time to find Crippen. Aboard the Montrose, the father and son were watched with interest. They seemed to be unduly affectionate and were constantly holding hands. Added to that, the boy's clothing was very ill-fitting. Captain Kendall had his suspicions, and he telegraphed a message to Scotland Yard. Dew, now determined to intercept the father and son, boarded a faster ship, the SS Laurentic, and the hunt was on. On Sunday, July 31st, Dew and the officers boarded the Montrose as it sailed up the St. Lawrence. The father and son were identified as Crippen and Ethel Lenave. Both were arrested, and after three weeks were escorted back to England to face trial. On his arrest, Crippen reportedly told Chief Inspector Dew, I'm not sorry. The anxiety has been too much. It was decided that the pair should not be tried together. Crippen would face his trial first, and once that verdict had been determined, Ethel Lenave would take her turn in the dock to be tried as an accessory. So it was that on the 18th of October, Crippen stood alone in the dock at the Old Bailey before the Lord Chief Justice of England, Lord Alverstone. The proceedings would last until the 22nd, which is just four days, relatively meager trial length for such a serious crime. Crippen's defense was simple. The body found in the cellar of his home was not Bell's. The body must have been some poor, unknown woman and been placed there before he and Bell had moved in. It was, therefore, crucial to the prosecution to prove that the body was Bell's. One piece of the flesh found in the shallow grave had borne a scar 
scar, and medical records showed that Bell had such a scar on her lower abdomen. More conclusive was the fact that the remains had been wrapped in a pajama jacket, and a tag inside that jacket led to the manufacturers, Jones Brothers. They confirmed that this particular cloth and pattern was not issued until late 1908, proving that the body must have been placed there after that date. This, and the scar, was consistent with the body being of Bell Elmore. Not to stick up for Crippen too hard here, but he didn't allegedly kill his wife until 1910. Somebody could have stuck that body down there prior to that, although I guess they did move in in 1907, so it's quite unlikely. Medical tests had shown that the flesh contained traces of hyosin, a poison, and here is a very damning piece of evidence. And it was known that Crippen had purchased five grains of that substance on January 17th, two weeks before Bell had vanished. It was enough for the jury, who took just under 30 minutes to find Crippen guilty of his wife's murder. Wow, no messing. Under 30 minutes in a case where all the evidence is actually circumstantial, that seems quick. He was, after all, a doctor that worked for a homeopathic medicine company, so there could be all kinds of reasons for him buying substances that were not fatal in small amounts. You could buy a large amount of it to make 100 doses for the company. Just saying. And then, on October 25th, Ethel Linnae was put on trial as an accessory to murder and found not guilty. A subsequent appeal on behalf of Crippen was dismissed and his death sentence was confirmed. Less than a month later, on Wednesday, November 23rd, 1910, 48-year-old Crippen was hanged at Pentonville by John Ellis and William Willis. Crippen's last request had been for a photograph of Ethel and some of her letters to be buried with with him in his unmarked grave. That request was granted. Between the alleged confession of Chief Inspector Drew, the scar, the death by poisoning, the poison that Crippen was known to have purchased shortly before his wife's death, the same poison that killed her, and the transatlantic flight with his mistress, the case against Harvey Crippen seems pretty open and shut, right? Wouldn't you say, Stuart? I would say I'd probably have thought he's guilty, yeah. It seems clear-cut, but not everyone, even today, thinks so. Notably, a distant relative of Crippen, a James Patrick Crippen of Ohio. That's Ohio, USA. He's the second cousin three times removed of Dr. Holly Crippen. He hopes to officially exonerate the black sheep of the family and bring his remains back to the family plot in Michigan for a decent burial. The evidence says the man should be pardoned, he says. But everyone thinks of him as a murderer. Every time I go through customs in England, someone's made a comment about my name linking me to the murderer. The torso was identified as Cora Crippen's by a scar. The doctor was shown to have bought a large amount of the drug that killed her. This we know. But could it all have been a huge miscarriage of justice? Was Crippen innocent after all? A growing body of people believe so, including the family member just mentioned and forensic scientists. There is in fact a campaign underway to clear his name. One line of evidence comes from John Trestail, a toxicologist who has long puzzled over the mutilation of the corpse. The remains found were a torso without bones or sex organs. Mutilation is an extreme unusual behavior among poisoners, Mr. Trestale says. A poisoner wants the death to appear natural so he can get a death certificate and not go to prison, not have to flee from the law. This is the only case that I know of where a poison victim was dismembered. It doesn't make sense. I have an immediate rebuttal to that, which is, it's made very clear in the telling of this story that Dr. Crippen saw his wife as a shrew and harbored a huge amount of resentment against her. He's also was a small man. So he may have knocked her out with the drug because he was unsure of his ability to subdue her for an act of violence and then committed such horrible mutilation because of all of the frustration, hatred, and etc. that he harbored toward her. But this person is more of an expert than I and says, never in my entire career have I seen a poison victim whose body was mutilated. It's always bothered this guy forever, his entire career, because obviously this murder happened 110 years ago, so he's been looking at it for a while. So because Because of his misgivings about a poisoner mutilating a body, Mr. Trestale brought in Professor David Foran, Director of Forensic Science at Michigan State University, who led DNA analysis on the scarred skin of the corpse used in the trial. It was demanding work that took two years to retrieve the tissue that was preserved in formaldehyde from a glass slide to which it had been attached with pine resin, which is what they did back in 1910. Professor Foran, that's F-O-R-A-N, followed two lines of research and 
considers his results conclusive. First, he isolated mitochondrial DNA, which remains unchanged throughout the generations down the female line. A genealogist found grand nieces of Cora Crippen, who would have the same mitochondrial DNA as her, and repeated tests found that they were not related to the body in the basement. Then, Mr. Foran's team used new techniques to examine the nuclear DNA and discovered a Y chromosome. Not only was this body not from Cora Crippen's family, it was not even a woman. Now that gets really interesting because that actually explains the mutilation, the removal of the bones, and the sex organs. Because a man's body, sure, if you remove the sex organs, most likely anyone's seen a cadaver, even the bones, the arms, the legs, all the parts of a man's body are going to be identifiable as a man's and not a woman's body. Is it possible that Cora did in fact leave Holly Crippen and essentially worked with somebody to frame him for her murder? out of spite. And then Crippen just took up with his mistress and gave her the jewels because he was like, well, my wife left anyway. What am I going to do? I've always hated her. She's always hated me. I don't know. But here's what Mr. Tresdale says. This is the slide which Spilsbury, the expert witness at Crippen's trial, used to identify the body as Cora Crippen's. And this was the evidence on which Crippen was convicted. But the substance on the slide is not Cora Crippen. There's no question. He says, I don't say Holly Crippen is innocent. What I say is, he's no longer proven guilty. Not everyone is convinced. There's a writer and genealogist from San Diego, which is where I live, named Jonathan Menges. He disputes Mr. Foran's findings for a number of reasons, but one of the key things is that he said that the that the science in this case, because Crippen is such a famous figure, was done with too much of an eye for showbiz. It turns out that the nuclear DNA findings that Tresdale finds conclusive were first revealed on a TV documentary, and he points out that they have not yet been published or peer-reviewed. He says, Crippen's behavior demonstrates his guilt, and that now there's a group in Salt Lake City, Utah, who are investigating the mysterious disappearance of Crippen's first wife. Added to everything else, it now turns out that Crippen's first wife mysteriously disappeared. Of course, the scientist says it's gonna be published in a peer-reviewed journal, it just hasn't been yet. So there's some back and forth among experts, each of whom has a vested financial interest in being correct. One of them wrote a book about how guilty he was. The other one did groundbreaking DNA research that found him to be no longer proven guilty. So believe what you want, he seems pretty darn guilty to me. On the flip side, the guy that did the DNA research is a professor at Michigan State University. It's a well-regarded university. It's a little bit hard to believe that somebody in that position would just kind of cowboy their way through something this important. So there's a bit of a question mark here at the end. So if he was peer-reviewed and let's say categorically was found not to have been the murderer that he was convicted of being and ultimately killed for. Is there any way of recovering from that as that wrongly convicted person? I don't know. I mean, there must be situations where that has happened. I can't give you a specific example. I know I've seen headlines before about somebody or the other being released from prison because the DNA science didn't exist when they were convicted and now they're being let go. I think the realities of being incarcerated make it pretty hard to react acclimate even if you were always innocent and as far as your reputation recovering poof i do think it's an interesting distinction though that what the science proves if it is indeed correct is that that was not cora's body it does not necessarily prove that holly crippen didn't murder cora maybe that was the body of her lover that he killed and dismembered in a jealous rage and he just hid her body better he may still be guilty of the murder even if that is not cora that was the scientist point saying, I'm not saying he's innocent, I'm just saying he's no longer proven guilty. Just perhaps a, dif- a distinction without a difference, but perhaps not. And that is the story of Dr. Devil's Breath. I love it. I love the story. I love how you tell it. It's just so... Uh, I don't know, you hook me and you, you've got a real way with words in my opinion. I think you're a good storyteller. That's why I like your show, that's why I like you. I hope you all enjoyed that as a listener. It was sort of a hybrid of an American-British case, but you also got a dedicated British teaser case at the start there more modern one to wet the whistle as it were but what i would like you to do is to check out zevin odelberg on kind of murdery check him out spotify apple all your good podcast platforms give him a review 
get in touch on Instagram. You're on TikTok now, right? Yeah, I'm on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, all of it. At Kinda Murdery on each one. At Kinda Murdery. Not at Kind of. Kinda. K-I-N-D-A. Murdery. Kinda Murdery. Get involved. I know you're active on all of those. If you want to speak to him, hit him up. Remember the stuff we said at the start. If you're struggling with mental health, disabilities, anything you want to speak to, we've both given the numbers and you could reach out to either of us as well if you want to speak to us. But it's been a pleasure and thanks for your time, Zevin. Any closing statements you'd like to make? No, thank you so much for having me, for giving me an opportunity to introduce myself to your audience and I've just had a great time, Stuart. I always enjoy getting to hang out with you. I know it's late there in England. I appreciate you staying wide awake for my benefit. All I have to say is thank you. And thank you to your listeners for taking the time to listen, hear me out as well. No worries. Now, we always end the show by saying cheerio. And I want to give you the opportunity to say, until next time, cheerio. Can you do that for me? That's a big responsibility. But yeah, let me I'll do that. Until next time, cheerio. You've just heard British Murders with Stuart Blues. Please make a point of finding British Murders on whatever podcaster you use. Subscribe, follow, and start listening. Stuart is a wonderful storyteller, and it's always a pleasure to spend time with him. For Stuart Blues and British Murders Podcast, I'm Zevin Odelberg, and this has been Kinda Murdery.